Die Kimsi ist auch da, die sollten wir eintreten lassen, oder? Auf jeden Fall. Wäre bestimmt sinnvoll. Sie kommt. Super. Und Eva und Daniel und Guillaume auch, oder? Ja, genau. Okay, Livestream läuft. Das heißt, Wiebke, ich übergebe jetzt die Hostrechte an dich. Und ist es jetzt schon, wird jetzt schon übertragen auf ähm, YouTube? Ja. Wenn der Livestream jetzt schon läuft, dann können wir jetzt gar nicht mehr sprechen. Können wir schon, aber man hört es halt. Okay.
Dear participants, dear students, dear teachers, researchers, general staff, and also interested parties from the Epicure universities and beyond, I would like to welcome you kindly to the very first Epicure Forum coordinated by the University of Strasbourg and by KIT, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Great to have you all with us here today. I would like to extend a welcome to you if you are joining us on Zoom or if you're joining us while watching the live stream over on YouTube during this fully virtual event. Now, today we are celebrating the first Epicure anniversary on the road to becoming a true European university. European Partnership for, Innov for an Innovative Campus Unifying Regions, or EPICURE, as it is uh, abbreviated and uh, a lot easier to say, is a first-generation European University Alliance co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. It connects eight higher education institutions from a total of six European countries. The University of Strasbourg in France, the Ada Mikiewicz University in Poznan, Poland. We have the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki in Greece, University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, Austria, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, as I just mentioned, the University of Haute Alsace in France in two locations, Mulhouse and Colmar. We have the Albert Ludwigs University in Freiburg in Germany, and of course, the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Well, dear participants, over the course of the next three days, you will have the opportunity to explore the Epicure Alliance in depth and also discover the entrepreneurial ecosystems, sustainable developments and initiatives of the eight universities and also beyond. We will be offering you a lot over the course of the next three days. We have workshops, we have a panel discussion, we have a virtual startup tour, we have keynotes on sustainability and entrepreneurship, and of course, we have the Erasmus Feeling Challenge and much, much more. We really hope that you use this opportunity to connect and to network on this large international, albeit fully virtual, European stage. Today, this afternoon, the Erasmus Feeling Challenge began and Epicure students formed international teams and they began working on finding an answer to the following question. How can you achieve a true Erasmus feeling during a fully virtual semester abroad? Not an easy question. Well, the teams have three days time to find some creative solutions and also answers, and they will be rewarded with great prizes on Friday evening. Now, if you would like to inform yourself about our very extensive and inspiring schedule, the speakers, the networking opportunities and everything, please feel free to consult our program at any time. You can do so um, in two ways. You can either check out our Indico page, which is our conference platform, which is uh, where you landed when you registered. And uh, it's a platform that might not be known to non-physicists, but uh, we're opening it up now to a broader range. Um, on Indico, you can find um, a, a couple of recorded elements. We have an etiquette video. Uh, there will be the speech of Juana Dumitrescu, who uh, is a general director general of education and culture at the European Commission. And she took the time today to speak to the students who are taking part in the Erasmus Feeling Challenge. Um, you can also head over to our website, epicure.education, for more information. Before we begin, I'd like to also introduce myself to you. My name is Kimsi von Reichach. I'm a freelance moderator and presenter. I do forums, panel discussions, uh, and much, much more. I host events on stage. Remember when we all used to be in a room together, which I hope we can be again very soon, and also, like in this case, fully virtual. And um, I have to say, I'm really delighted to uh, have been asked to be part of this uh, very first virtual forum. I'm very much looking forward to the program, the panel discussion, and much, much more. Before we begin, a couple of remarks on etiquette. Now, I'm sure all of us, you, me, and everybody has uh, become a little bit of an expert in the past nine months in regards to video conferencing. But I do find that every conference is a little bit different. Uh, so here's a couple of uh, uh, gentle reminders about our netiquette. 
we ask you to please uh, turn off your camera and microphone if you're watching us on Zoom to ensure your data protection and also a high quality streaming. This forum will take place in English, uh, but of course we embrace a very pragmatic form of multilingualism. Um, now, people who speak German, French, Dutch, Polish, Greek, uh, they might be able to provide ad hoc translations to questions that you might have. If you have a question to one of our keynote speakers, you can very easily, if you are on Zoom, uh, pose it into the chat directly to the person Q and A, and then the um, person, uh, the speaker that is speaking. And we do this to ensure a smooth running of the formats. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about how to address those questions then later. Um, if there are too many questions, then it might be that we don't have the time to answer all of them. And for this, I apologize in advance already. Um, we will be deactivating comments on YouTube and we offer two types of support should you have any difficulties. Um, if you're experiencing an issue right here in Zoom, you can just send a direct message uh, to IT support and we can help you there. And if you have um, trouble joining the meetings, you can do so um, by going to the following page, which you can find on Indico, which is public.senfcall.com. De uh, slash Epicure support, but there's a link you can click and that's a lot easier than me saying that. We ask participants on Zoom to please use your real names and so we can identify you easier and it also makes networking just a little bit nicer. And for best results, dear Zoom viewers, we ask you to please activate the speaker view, which you can do in the top right corner. We have a hashtag, which I'd like to show you here in my roll up. If you can see it, it's be Epicurious. If you wanna be active on social media, then please use this hashtag and tweet it if you like. And we also wanna get interactive with you now. And for this, we have prepared a little Menti Meta survey. And uh, I would uh, kindly ask Alexander Titel. Uh, he is part of the organizational task force at this time to share his screen. And then we can get uh, to the first of two questions. Okay, so here's a code. As you can see, it's a QR code. You just take your cell phone, uh, if you have a smartphone near you and uh, scan the code. Or you can also go to menti.com and enter 1509301. Oh, and if you do that, then you shall see two questions. We have two questions prepared for you. The first one is we'd like to know from you, what city are you joining us from today? We want to find out where our viewers are joining us from today. So of course, this is open not only to our viewers on Zoom, but also on YouTube. So where are you joining us from today? And the second question is, hey, tell us what background you have. Please choose one category. Now, I know that might be difficult for some of you to just choose one but choose the category that most uh, applies to you. And um, let's have a look at the results in just a few moments, if I can ask Alexander to show us what the results are. Let's see where everybody's coming from today and let's see what. Okay, so here's a Wortwolke, as we say in German, word cloud in English. Okay, so a lot of our viewers are from Karlsruhe. And a lot of them from Freiburg, Thessaloniki, Strasbourg, of course, also Offenburg and Waghäusle. Hello, Waghäusle. Great to have you here. Who else do we have? Marseille. We have Berlin. Okay. So those are the results. And of course, Offenburg also. But it seems like uh, Karlsruhe, most, uh, most of you guys are from Karlsruhe. Um, okay. So let's go to the second question, which was uh, where we asked you, what background are you from? What category? Okay, and it's administrative staff. A lot of you are from the administrative field. We also have teachers, researchers, we have young professionals, we have students, um, and we have one person from the public sector. Hello, dear person from the public sector. Great to have you with us today. So I think uh, that was a lot of information. Uh, as I said, you can read all of this on the Indico page. Thank you, Alexander, by the way, for, for sharing your screen. Um, so you can get all this information on the Indico page and also on the epicure.education page. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker of the day of the Epicure Forum here this evening. Please give a big round of virtual applause to the president of the University of Strasbourg and chairman of Epicure. Please welcome Professor Dr. Michel Deneken. I hand over to you.
Now, I don't see um, President Denikin yet, but I do see Vice President Professor Dr. Thomas Hirt. So I don't know, uh, Vice President, if you uh, would like to possibly jump the queue, so to speak, or should we wait a minute until President Denikin is with us? I, I can't hear you yet. On the microphone. Good afternoon, everybody, especially many thanks to the moderator. Uh, I think we should wait for some minutes. Uh, probably uh, Wiebke Kröschler can contact somebody at the University of Strasbourg to find out if he is available or not. But I think he, I, I, have, see, I have seen him virtually this morning in a conference, so he is on board. So I hope that he will be all, can also join our meeting as soon as possible. I just got the, the message uh, that Wiebke Kröschler is on it. She's working on it. So the president okay. should, be, should be with us uh, very, very shortly. So that should just take a, a few moments so far. Yes. So while we're waiting, um, Vice President, uh, can I ask you, did you have a chance to uh, look at the teams uh, that are taking part in the Erasmus Feeling Challenge? No, I have not the opportunity. I was in several meetings just a minute before I had, can join this meeting today. So I had no chance. I hope I will have this tomorrow. So can I have a more closer look on all these very nice events of this uh, first public forum of Epicure? Okay. And if, if you would have to answer the question, how to describe a uh, Erasmus feeling if you're doing a virtual semester abroad, um, what would you say to that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very difficult situation at the moment. And I think everybody at each university in Europe will do the very best to bring students together and to give them the opportunity to have, uh, let me say, uh, so-called uh, virtual feeling of what Erasmus in under normal circumstances will be. But I think uh, it's not uh, comparable to the situation we had before last year, for example, uh, because I think it's very important uh, that during education at university, you have the chance to go to several places in Europe or outside of Europe. So now I think I see the picture of Michael Denikin, he is now on board uh, from just from the other side of the river of the Rhine. Fantastic. So Vice President, I'll get back to you a little bit later. And with that, I will try again. Please give a big round of virtual applause to the President of the University of Strasbourg and Chairman of Epicure. Please welcome Professor Dr. Michel Denikin. Great to have you with us, sir. Hello, it's wonderful. You begin really at five o'clock. What's well, very difficult to understand for French people, but okay. I was uh, I had another video conference with our mayor of Strasbourg. Um, so thank you very much. I'm very happy to welcome everybody to this uh, first forum. I I was told you are more than four hundred. Okay, is it real? Four hundred people connected during these both days. It's wonderful. Uh, we spoke to, uh, this morning with, uh, with the, our steering committee and um, Professor Hirt that it's very important for us to give really a concrete existence, a body of, uh, 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 to Epicure and the really embodying of our uh, Epicure project is the reality of the students. And I, I agree, I'm happy to welcome all the students uh, that are our reason of life and of duty and of business um, to be here for this forum. And if I take the etymology of the word forum, it's really um, a place where um, different opinions, cultures, languages can share um, contradictions, but also um, maybe, I, I suppose, um, um, shared values and shared uh, commitments. Uh, the, this forum is uh, an invitation to local, uh, regional and European stakeholders, as well as the members of its diverse academic communities to explore uh, the reality. Um, and it's a kind of uh, proof of concept of our Epicure Alliance and its many inspiring uh, projects 
that lay the foundation for one of the first Shuri universities. This morning, we spoke with, uh, with Professor Hitt, do we want to enlarge uh, our alliance to other universities? Or do we take uh, the time in the next years to make deeper and closer our relationship? And um, we, um, uh, we found uh, together that the, the, the way, the first good way is to deepen our relationship, make it closer, and to begin with forums and sharing opinions and cultures. The focus of your forum is very important, uh, entrepreneurship and sustainable development. The intersection of sustainability and entrepreneurship is a source of discovery. It's a new thing for our French universities, uh, I must say. Um, and perhaps it's uh, maybe more, um, uh, more uh, familiar in your universities, but in France, it's something very new, but I think very amazing and important. For this reason, uh, Epico Alliance dedicates its first annual forum to these topics, which are at the heart of its many projects. Universities offer entrepreneurial students excellent conditions, I, I may say, and support programs for creating innovative products and services. I don't forget our um, pandemic um, context. I know that very much students and teachers are tired, stressed by the situation and um, the difficulty to uh, make uh, this uh, um, to 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 win the fight against this second wa wave of the virus, but it's important, in spite of um, physical presence, that we have this connected presence and uh, possibility to uh, work together. And the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, will be for the next uh, edition of this forum, when we'll be, we'll have the joy to be physically together. Uh, we all wish less connection and more meeting, but by now connection is better than desert and uh, solitude. Um, the Epico Alliance is deeply committed to build also a project uh, in um, a multicultural and multilinguistic uh, experience. And um, I think this is a very important moment, this first forum, because of its uh, focus, but because also of, is, of its uh, um, reality. Uh, it's a difficult um, period for all the students and um, particularly for uh, Erasmus students. Epicure uh, will provide an opportunity to adapt the mobility and offers a new way to participate in courses of, uh, from uh, other universities. Tomorrow morning, I will be with uh, two other presidents um, hosted by our prime minister in France. And we hope that we will, he will allow us to begin a presential teaching, physically present uh, at, um, in January. That means, um, I hope spring in winter, okay? Uh, we all miss you, students and colleagues. And uh, we want to prepare this wonderful spring uh, the post-COVID period uh, by this first forum. So I, I, um, I bet that in the next weeks, we will all win the challenge uh, against uh, the virus. And um, I hope that this forum of today is 
a way of resistance and resilience to say no, the, the virus will not um, uh, kill our European projects, will not kill Epicure. At the contrary, we have to be more committed with you, students, teachers, and engineers to win this fight of civilization. This morning, and I finish with it, we also become aware that Europe is uh, a Europe of values and that we are uh, committed in some very important challenges concerning the place of science denouncing fake news or false science. Uh, values of European humanistic universities against all um, wars, civil wars between uh, regions, um, between ideologies. Also to be here to affirm the equality between men and women, that science is um, seeking a truth and that we cannot compromise our commitment for truth uh, with political or ide ideological or business-oriented uh, convictions. We have to prepare really uh, Epicure Alliance as a positive, optimistic reality in Europe. Our values are not the values of the old world, but values uh, that are um, today more important than uh, ne never they were. Um, so I wish the forum to be a great success, to be a moment of uh, Epicure's really embodying. And I thank very much to KIT and uh, uh, President Delegate uh, Thomas Hirt, our colleague and friend, to be our host. Thank you very much and um, very great and very successful forum. Thank you very much, President Denikin, for your kind opening words. And thank you also for your very positive outlook, which I think is in times like these even more important than ever. So I thank you very much. And with this, dear participants, we now move on to our next speaker. And um, I can now formally introduce him instead of just saying, oh, he's here online already. So let me uh, do him the honor of properly introducing him. He has been since 2016 the Vice President for Innovation and International Affairs at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and he is responsible for the entrepreneurial activities there. Please welcome now Vice President Professor Dr. Thomas Hirt. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much for this very kind introduction, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, dear participants of the first forum of uh, EPICUR, Dear students, dear representatives from public, politics, industry, society, and science, dear speakers, dear Michelle Dinneken, dear members of EPICOR, dear colleagues, welcome to this unique event of EPICOR, the European Partnership for Innovative Unifying Regions. We at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, the KIT, feel very honored to host the first EPICOR public forum this year and we are very pleased that more than 400 participants have registered for the next three days forum. The motto of the first EPICOR public forum, entrepreneurship and sustainable development is from my point of view, very well selected and fits also very well to our present time, which is characterized as Michel Dennigan mentioned before by great challenges and transformation processes. In my talk, I would like to look at all these two issues, entrepreneurship and sustainable development, from once from a European perspective and also from an institutional perspective. The two elements of this year's EPICOR Public Forum, entrepreneurship and sustainable development are deeply anchored in the concept and strategy of UCOR of EPICOR, the Erasmus Plus project, 
with the topic of connecting regions through entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship and the project Epicure Research, shaping European society in transition with a strong focus on sustainability. European universities are of particular importance in the context of transformation processes in Europe, since they play a key and leading role with their tasks, read, teaching, research, innovation, and service to society in this transformation process. The Epicur Forum of the next three days is an opportunity to connect, to share experiences, and to develop ideas with all members of the alliances and stakeholders, because collaboration is a crucial element of the transformation process. It will also provide an occasion to discover the entrepreneurial and sustainable ecosystems of the eight universities of the Alliance. We would have liked to welcome all of you personally in Karlsruhe to show you the diversity in entrepreneurship and research and innovation for sustainable development at KIT and the innovation ecosystem of the Karlsruhe technology region with a strong focus on mobility, energy, digitalization, climate and environment. But unfortunately, this is not possible at present due to the pandemic. Therefore, this year's forum is a fully virtual event. The motto of this event fits as well with the KIT strategy, because innovation is a core task and the strengthening of entrepreneurship and the support of startups is a key element of KIT's innovation strategy. The KIT, the Research University and the Helmholtz Association was funded in the year 2009 by a merger of the former University of Karlsruhe and the former Research Center of Karlsruhe as part of the first phase of the excellence competition in Germany. Today, KIT has more than 24,000 students and 9,000 employees from more than 125 countries. Besides research and teaching, technology and knowledge transfer is a key element of the KIT strategy. Therefore, innovation and entrepreneurial thinking and acting are deeply rooted in KIT. For example, three of the founders of SAP, the market leader in end-to-end -end enterprise applications, software, and the top cloud company have studied in Karlsruhe, and every year KIT reaches top positions in the founder radar and the startup monitor. Innovation is one of the eight fields of action of the KIT strategy. And 2018, KIT has adopted his innovation strategy with a strong focus on strategic corporations and partnerships with industry, intellectual property and new revenues from licenses, entrepreneurship and startups, as well as culture of innovation. As vice president for innovation and international affairs, it is also a matter of my heart that we promote culture of innovation and entrepreneurial spirit among our researchers and students. Because the power of innovation will help us to solve important problems for humanity in the 21st century, we have to encourage our young people for this. Prior to this background, we have founded the so-called KIT Gründerschmiede or Founders Forge in the year 2013 to support persons willing to found a company as well as a company, young entrepreneurs on their first steps, students and researchers. And as of today, the KIT Gründerschmiede is one of the largest activities at German universities. And every year, more than 30 companies are founded by students and researchers at KIT with a peak value of 50 in the year 2019. And with a pioneer garage, we have the largest student group for entrepreneurship in Germany. For the future, we at KIT strongly focus on internationalization of startups. With a global horizon program at KIT, 
which is founded by the EXIST program of the German government. In addition, international cooperation, bilateral corporations and networks strengthen the profile and shape and sharpen research, education and innovation at KIT, a reason why we are partner of Epicor. And KIT's commitment to sustainable development and the sustainable development goals are clearly mentioned in our mission. And it's clearly indicated that KIT takes its responsibility for sustainable development seriously by ensuring sustainable development as a cross-sectional task and strategic orientation. In its strategy, the KIT has clearly formulated that KIT provides knowledge for the benefit of the society and the environment and makes significant contributions to the global challenges facing of humanity in the fields of energy, mobility, information, climate, and environment. And therefore, KIT is preparing his students through research-oriented courses for responsible positions in society, economy, and science. And as a part of the implementation of the measures of the Excellence University proposal, which has the motto, Living the Change, we have also decided to establish an academy for responsible research, teaching, and innovation for our students, doctoral students, and researchers. With today's event, the lectures, the panel discussions, and other formats, and also for the next two days, we would like to make a substantial contribution to the discourse in our society about sustainability and the contribution of innovation and entrepreneurship to sustainable development. Europe and the world are currently facing major challenges such as climate change, energy system transformation, digitalization, and combating disease. By the year 2030, for example, the world's population will increase to more than 8 billion people. The global energy demand will increase by more than 50%, the demand for raw materials by more than 100%, and the demand for food and water by more than 40%. In this context, the question arises how we can manage this. Europe's want to give answers to this question and therefore Europe's strategy for the 21st century includes the following priorities. A European Green Deal, that means that Europe aims to be first climate neutral continent by becoming a modern and resource efficient economy. A Europe fit for the digital age, that means that Europe's digital strategy will empower people with a new generation of technologies. And last, an economy that works for people, that means that the Europe, European Union must create a more attractive investment environment and growth that creates quality jobs, especially for young people and small business. The megatrends, as mentioned before, have a strong impact on innovation systems and the challenges of the 21st century can be faced only by innovations. Over the next decades, disruptive as well as sustaining innovations will change our lives. Therefore, cooperation with industry in various formats and the support for startups are decisive elements of an innovation strategy. But technological innovation alone is rarely the solutions and change in societal cultures are also essential. Therefore, technology and knowledge transfer of universities, as well as the dialogue with society, is essential. And to achieve this, we must bring entrepreneurship and sustainability much more closer together than today. Sustainable entrepreneurship stands for a business-driven concept of sustainability, which focuses on increasing both social as well as business value, the so-called shared value. Based on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations for 2030, which are published in the year 2050, 
I took out the following five fields of action, which address several sustainable development goals and which are already addressed by startups and established companies together with partners from universities and research organizations. Firstly, sustainable raw material supply, production, use, and recycling. During the past 20 years, the per capita material footprint of developing countries increased from five metric tons to nine metric tons. Should the global population reach more than 9 billion people by the year 2050, the equivalent of almost three planets could be required to provide the natural resources needed to sustain current lifestyles. As our contribution, KIT has founded the so-called think tank industrial resource strategies in the year 2018, together with industry and politics to develop strategies and concepts for resource efficiency and circular economy. Secondly, biodiversity, land use, and bioeconomy. Each year, an estimated one third of all food produced ends up rotting in the bins of consumers and retailers or spoiling due to poor transportation and harvesting practices. Therefore, we have to develop strategies to reduce bio waste and to convert bio waste in other bio resources to valuable products. In this context, microorganisms are key to ecosystem services and bioeconomy, but their contribution are still poorly known and rarely acknowledged. Bioeconomy, together with circular economy, will be a very important sector for the European Union. As our contribution, KIT developed together with other universities and research organizations in Baden-Württemberg, the so-called research strategy bioeconomy Baden-Württemberg. Thirdly, drinking water production and wastewater treatment. Less than 3% of the world's water is fresh or drinkable, and three in 10 people lack access to safely managed drinking water services. More than 80% of wastewater resulting from human activities is discharged into rivers or sea without any pollution removal. Water processing has a long tradition in Germany as well as in Europe, strongly influenced by SMEs and offers a great potential for internationalization. As our contribution, KIT established with other universities the so-called Water Research Network Baden-Württemberg in order to develop solutions for uh, sustainable water supply. Fourth, energy productivity and renewable energies. Three billion people rely on wood, coal, charcoal, or animal waste for cooking and heating. And 13% of the global population still lacks access to modern electricity. On one side, the integration of renewable energies in the existing grid is a great challenge. On the other side, it offers opportunities for startups and SMEs in areas like grid simulation and new business models for energy. KIT is one of the founders of the AIT InnoEnergy, the innovative engine for sustainable energy across Europe, supported by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology which provides new products, new solutions, new services for the energy sector. Fifth, sustainable mobility and urban development. The world's cities occupy just around 3% of the Earth's land, but account for 60 to 80% of the energy consumption and 75% of carbon emissions. For the future, it is necessary to provide access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport systems for all. Sustainable, mobi sustainable mobility is an excellent opportunity to develop and found startups, for example, for renewable fuels, batteries, and fuel cells, as we can see in different places all around Europe. As our contribution together with industry, 
KIT develops the climate neutral refinery of the future, which can produce fuels for different sustainable mobility applications. As a result, it can be said that sustainability and entrepreneurship are not contradictory and sustainable development is a common task for society, economy and science. And we can only be strong and competitive through cooperation and transfer. With the first Epicure Forum, we focus on entrepreneurship and sustainability. And with this Epicure can contribute to make Europe Firstly, more sustainable. Secondly, more digital. Thirdly, more resilient. And fourth, more social. I would like to end with a motto, which I think fits very well to this forum and especially to Epicure. The best way to cope with the challenges of the future is to shape it actively and jointly. At the end, I would like to thank especially Wiebke Gröschler from KIT and the KIT team together with all the Epicure partners for organizing this first Epicure public forum. And I would like to thank you for your kind attention and I wish you all the best for the first Epicure public forum with interesting talks and discussions and please stay healthy. Thank you very much, Vice President Hood, for your kind opening remarks and your speech. And I'm very sure that in the course of the next three days, we will be working on making the society more sustainable, social, digital, and of course, also resilient. So thank you very much. I'll be speaking to you again on Friday evening, I believe. Yes. Very much okay. forward to that. Thank you very much. And with that, dear participants, it's my pleasure to introduce you now to our first keynote speaker of the day. He spent a total of 12 years at SAP, beginning as an application developer and following as an assistant to CEO Henning Kagerman. And then he became director of the SAP Research Center in Karlsruhe. He uh, is going to have a big year next year because then it's going to be 10 years that he joined KIT as a full professor. And he heads the Institute for today, the Institute for Entrepreneurship, Technology Management and Innovation there, short N Tech Non. Now, in this keynote, we're going to look at a couple of questions. How can entrepreneurship and becoming an entrepreneur even be taught? How does N Tech Non structure this? And what steps in teaching do they apply? We'll also find out about a very special a method which was developed at KIT called TAS, but I don't want to give away too much. Um, and we'll also look into the future. What opportunities are still lying untapped and how can sustainability be looped in among other points? Now, since this is the very first keynote uh, that we have in our forum here, let me just give you some brief um, pieces of information on how you can direct your questions to our speaker. So it's very easy. If you have a question that you would like to ask our keynote speaker, please send a private message uh, directly to Q&A tab, see this, and uh, then the questions will be directed to me and I can direct them to your keynote speaker. Unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity to receive questions from you. YouTube at this point. So with this, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce and ask to the virtual stage now Professor Dr. this happen? Can you all see my screen? Can I have some signal? Yep, I can see it. Uh, we can see it. I'll speak okay. for everybody. Okay, wonderful. Good. So uh, you already said some words about myself, maybe some interesting details also that originally I'm educated as a physicist. So I've got a natural science and engineering background, if you wish, in my education, and then later on in my uh, professional career. Uh, I did work on concrete things and uh, I also co-created twice a company. 
And uh, with that experience, I came to the KIT. And since almost 10 years now, I'm working on these things. I'm, of course, not alone. There is a team. Um, we are roughly 12 researchers, all in all. Eight of them are working at the Institute, but there are also some that work in industry or other organizations that pursue a PhD uh, project. So um, based on that, we do have a certain research, um, sorry, this is one thing. Um, we do have a certain research footprint and we try to understand the domain. And based on that, we teach. This is what I will share with you to some extent, give you at least some impression on that. But we also do support people in innovations. For instance, we do um, organize an accelerator program at the KIT. Now, Thomas here already gave you some impression about the entrepreneurial activity at the KIT. So over the past 10 years or nine and something years, I've seen literally hundreds of, of projects that have gone through that. Here is some uh, first impression. So you really get a feeling this, these are real companies. These, these are real projects that all have their own story. Um, some of them are very successful. Some of them are successful. Some of them are not successful. That's part of the game, I would say. But there is a, an intense uh, entrepreneurial activity and initiative going on at the KIT, both from the student community, but also from the researcher community. So with that said, with that short introduction, let me start with some words about entrepreneurship education. Now, if you think about entrepreneurship education, it is uh, always about um, the topic of competence. I think that's the, that's the key pedagogical topic that people look at when they look at higher education. So it's always about developing a competence. And in fact, it's interesting that although it's such a central notion and concept, it's not always really clear what people mean with it. So I hope I don't bother you with, you know, putting up this kind of, of you know, academic uh, thinking where I try to give you a definition. What in the world are we talking about? And then we can, uh, then we can think about what is an entrepreneurial competence. So if you look at the definition of a competence, then the definition that in a recent publication we chose to uh, suggest and which is in line with the European competence framework, but also for instance, with the US federal uh, definitions that are given, uh, we would define a competence as the um, disposition to generate adequate action. Now, let me start there, stop there for a moment. So it's a disposition, it's a possibility that you develop in somebody and then they can generate adequate action. Now, of course, we have to think about later on what is adequate action and we will go deeper into that. And this adequate actions are there to responsibly solve problems in variable situations. Now, this is important. It's not about something that is a standardized situation. For instance, if you're trained as a dentist, let me give you that simple example, you develop the competence to be a dentist, then obviously each patient that comes to you is different and you have to cope with these variable situations and each situations that you, the situation that you have to cope with is different. And you have to be able to adapt to that, flexibly adapt your knowledge, skill, and attitudes, because this is what you see in the second line. This is what competence is made of, if you wish. This is, these are the components. So knowledge, something, if you wish, related to the head. Skill, something related to the hand. So the ability to do something, but also attitude, maybe related to the heart, if you wish. So. This is what we mean by competence. And now, of course, the interesting question is, um, what is an entrepreneurial competence? Now, before I, I go into that a bit more in detail, I would like to share a short story. When I joined the KIT as a professor, uh, people asked me, you know, is this something you can teach at all? I, I remember I, I came and presented myself to the students and they asked, isn't this just something that you either you have it or you don't have it? And 
Actually, it's an interesting question and a good question. And there has been a lot of research done in order to shed light on that. Uh, and if you wish, my, my thinking about that would be maybe like you know playing the piano. Of course, you need to have some talent to play the piano, but of course it's something that you can teach to somebody. And of course there is a culture that you can develop in order to develop these kind of competencies. Now, what are entrepreneurial competencies then? Well, I think it's pretty straightforward. There are, they are the specific set of domain, well, maybe this is not so straightforward, relational or social, so how you relate to other people, and also self-competencies or personal competencies that you need in order to generate entrepreneurial action. And what I mean with entrepreneurial action, I'm, I'm borrowing here from the colleagues from Stanford, from um, the book that they've published. They um, characterize the entrepreneurial action as the activity to identify opportunities, to mobilize resources, to execute on a vision that you develop and to manage the risks that are related to it. So with that said, um, we can go to the different kinds of competencies. So there is first something which I call the personal competence or self-competence. So know your values, develop a vision, define your goals, decide under uncertainty, solve problems with creativity and learn to learn. So be, imagine, want, dare, do, and learn. These are things that I would pick from a long list which we've compiled, which are more than 70 things which are, which are reported in the scientific literature. But these are the things that I would pick or I choose as an entrepreneurial educator, where I think these are the personal competencies that we need to develop, always, again, based on knowledge, skills, and attitudes. And we could go deeper into that, but I'll show you how we do it practically, I think. This is, makes more sense. Now, there is also many social competencies that you have to develop. Um, they refer to, now let me be short and just read the short points below. Uh, so it's about lead, communicate, network, organize, persuade, negotiate. Now, all these things have to do not just with yourself, but also with the interaction that you have with other people, and thus are social competencies. And again, all these things in principle can be developed. So let me give you an example with the communication. Of course, you can try and train somebody to give a pitch, or you can, of course, also shed a lot of light on the quite complex topic of leadership, of entrepreneurial leadership. But still, these are things which you can train, where you can give people knowledge, what we know from the sciences. We know certain things about these things but you can also bring them in interaction with certain other people in certain situations and then have a reflection on that in order to really develop the skills and also reflect on the attitudes that you have. So in, so in all these things, there are things you can develop. And of course, then finally, there are domain competencies which have to do to some extent more with the traditional management sciences and with um, the, the business administration side, if you wish. So um, here it's about uh, identifying opportunities. Probably that's the core thing which you can start to develop. So there is something like this entrepreneurial gaze where you see things, where you see a possibility. And these are things where you can, again, give people knowledge around these things, train it, create some skills around it, and also very, very important, create the attitude. Many of these things have to do with how do I look at a certain situation? Then define a strategy. Well, there is an entire discipline, how to define strategies. Design a business model. This is something that we uh, can teach in a certain structured way. 
develop an innovative value proposition, create a marketing concept, mobilize resources, in particular mobilize funds in order to start up your company, then create a plan to implement these things, execute on the plan and identify and manage risks. All these are things which can be taught to a certain extent, again, like with piano playing, of course, certain talent also helped. When I talk about entrepreneurship education, I sometimes compare it to the training of airplane pilots. If you train an airplane pilot at the end of the day, he has to be a competent pilot. So he has to be able to sit in a cockpit pit and fly you safely from say Frankfurt to Shanghai. Um, and in order to do so, there are different steps which you go. Well, first, maybe there is this awareness building uh, where you simply you know, try to tell people, well, this is what pilots do and it could be an attractive job and everything. So you can do similar things in, in entrepreneurship, of course. But then the real training starts when people go to a classroom. A friend of mine in, in the United States is an airplane pilot and he told me in depth how he was trained. And of course, the first thing you do is you go to a classroom together with other people, you hear lectures, it's many, many topics. It's a very interdisciplinary thing. You have to learn about, I don't know, the atmosphere and the physics of the atmosphere. And of course, the technical setup of the airplane and what it means to be uh, in charge of the team. What's your legal responsibility? How you talk to the tower and many, many more things. And it's similar for an entrepreneur. He has to know, he or she has to know <clears throat> many different things in many different domains in order to be prepared for starting up a company. So all these are things where we can compile a certain body of knowledge that we want people to have an orientational knowledge and teach that. And this is something you can do just like for airplane pilots, you do it in a traditional classroom. This is something that you can do in a traditional lecture. And then once you have done that, um, obviously, the airplane pilot is not just, you know, sitting in the cockpit and flying, but he's sitting in a simulator for about 100 hours in order to sit in an environment that is emotionally, haptically, cognitively similar to the real world. But if the plane crashes, nobody's hurt. And there are similar things you can do with action learning and I'll walk you through some examples in a moment um, in order to train these kind of things. And then ultimately at a given point in time, yes, you sit in the cockpit, you really create a company, you are part of a, an entrepreneurial project. And again, this is a point in time where still people can support you with um, developing your competencies. Now, let me show you some formats. Basically, one of the formats is directly related to what I told you, which has to do with building up the orientational knowledge. This is something that we at the KIT do in a traditional, if you wish, lecture. We do that with PDFs and videos. Then we have a flipped classroom. So we meet online or offline in order to discuss the content, to go into more depth, and also to listen to guests to listen to people that have um, direct experience from the domain in which, uh, about which we talk. So if you wish, it's not a case study that you just read, but it is a live case where the people come and tell you what to do. And you see some of the topics that we deal with um, in this um, entrepreneurship education. Uh, setting. So we look at, of course, some basic concepts, the role in the economy, what is an opportunity, what is an entrepreneur, and all these kind of things. And then we talk about strategy and business model. We talk about entrepreneurial marketing, about intellectual property and technology ventures, about leadership, about funding a venture, um, and finally about business planning. And we do that, and then finally we write an exam. It's, it's if you wish, a traditional course. Uh, and this is 
the first part of what we do. But then, as I told you, this is not all. I mean, this is the classroom for the pilot training, and now it's about the simulator. And for uh, simulation uh, situations, or in order to create these um, action learning settings, one of the proven and, and I think well-suited formats is to do design thinking. So that's about user-centric innovation, <clears throat> where you look at situations, try to create empathy, try to compile a point of view, create prototypes, probe the prototypes with the people that you've been talking about. And we do that. <clears throat> we also have developed another format because we believe there is a second important kind of innovation process, which is not originated in this user-centric view, but which is originated in a technology-centric view. Now, let me be very clear. I would say roughly 90% of the startup projects that we observe have to do, I'm sorry, this is always flipping automatically, have to do with um, uh, the user-centric view, but still these 10%, which are technology-based, are very important. So we developed a certain method uh, in which we basically perform these three steps, and I could go into more, uh, I could go into much more depth than that. But for now, for this keynote, just let me say we characterize the technology, we do an ideation, a brainstorming, a structured brainstorming for the application. And then finally, we do a selection. Now, we based all these um, steps on an in-depth analysis of what we found in the literature about these processes. And again, I'm not explaining all the details here, but I just want to make you aware we have, I think, a profound and holistic understanding of the overall processes that happen and of which role we can play in a higher education setting for entrepreneurship education. Now, with that said, let me also give you two or three examples of what we do at the KIT and what, what I believe is a bit more advanced. It's probably similar to courses that you would find also at places like Stanford or at the Sloan School at the MIT. Um, but it has a particular twist, I would say, in the KIT. So here we cooperate with um, <clears throat> the faculty, in this case, of electrical engineering, and we combine an engineering course, so an engineering lab course, something which they have to do during their master's studies. They have to create some prototype anyhow. And we said, why not create that prototype not just as a technical artifact, but simulate a technology venture. So we support those people. It's a bigger format. It spreads about two semesters. There's an interim presentation. We have um, an involvement of industry of four or five companies that support these students with in-depth knowledge of the domain of the industry in which they want to develop their idea. And this is, I think, a very exciting format that we've done once so far, so last year, and we're just about to ramp it up for the first time. And I'm really excited about what, what's happening there because people really start, um, or it really unlocks the creativity of people, of the engineering people, and combines that engineering creativity with the question, how can we do something that is really useful and makes sense and responds to the big challenges that we see. Um, I would also like to say that we do have a couple of interesting international corporations. One of them is with the Urm Strasbourg. So that's uh, interesting, not just because uh, it's part of the Epicor network, um, so it's a bilateral seminar. We cooperate with the marketing um, professors. So we're four professors, two on the KIT side, two on the Strasbourg side, side and we create that um, seminar. And we always work in teams of two in tandems 
to make sure that we always have one student from Strasbourg and one student from the KIT. So they also have that intercultural friction and setting. This is also something that we do uh, in a um, joint entrepreneurship school, which we do with the Shanghai Jiao Tong University, one of the leading universities in China, technical universities in China. And typically, so we do that since 2018. So the traditional program was that we fly over to Shanghai with roughly 10 students from the KIT and meet another 10 students from Shanghai, do a course for one week, and then they come over to Karlsruhe for a second week. And we've created a structured program around this technology application selection process. So we take patents from the KIT and we ask them to transform these patents into exciting business ideas and finally give a pitch. We did that. Um, with investors in Shanghai. It was great to have really people from um, big and, and interesting investors that are part of the network of our colleagues in, in China. And we could pitch the ideas to them and get feedback on these things. Again, we work in tandem. So one uh, student from the KIT, one Chinese student. And that creates, of course, a very rich uh, intercultural um, experience. Imagine if you work on a project for two weeks, that really lowers the barriers for contacts. And we, we have created, I think, some interesting bonds and friendships with the people over there. Now, with that said, let me come to the last part of, of this keynote where I wanted to give an outlook. So what, what comes next? You know, I mean, interesting, there is a framework. I, I, I hope I could give you an, a short insight at least on what we do uh, with uh, these roughly um, 200 people per year uh, that come to our courses. And, uh, but it's interesting always to see what, what comes, what's next, you know, what's the next practices. And I think one of the interesting um, perspectives that I see is to um, go even deeper into a direction which we already do to some extent, but I think we can do it even more systematically and more consequently. And I think one way of looking at it is rooted in a Japanese tradition called Ikigai, it comes from Otinawa, from these islands south of Japan. Um, I think it's a place where the people are, uh, hundred years old and stuff like that. So it seems to be a very healthy place. Um, but they've developed this interesting concept of Ikigai where it's about, well, they say life's meaning, but you can also bring it down to very down to earth. Yes, it's about life's meaning, but also what will I do in my life? And basically they say, you have to find the right balance between these four things. So what, do I stand for? What do I love? What are my values? What can I do? What are my competencies? What does the world need? And how can I earn my money? What will I be paid for? And with these four questions, you can operationalize them. Now, I will go into more depth in two of these four aspects, namely the values and the what does the world need? Um, because the what can I be paid for is something that we do cater for in entrepreneurship education. It's this entire thing about business modeling, about, you know, can you make this something that is sustainable in the economic sense, that is viable, that can survive, that will have profits, because only if it has profits, it will be able to attract the investments before that. And the other things, the what can I do, the competences is also something that you typically bring into that. But interestingly enough, this what are my values and what does the world need is something where we can put in something that has to do a lot with sustainability. Now, with respect to the values, we build on, and here you maybe also see in some way how we link 
the research that we do with the teaching and the innovation support. So we, one of our PhD students who just did his um, defense a couple of weeks ago, Benedikt Teblich, he had worked on the question of how can we integrate values into the self-regulation of entrepreneurs. That's very important because entrepreneurs in a way have a very challenging life and the self-regulation seems to be very important for them um, in order to you know, make them robust in what they do. And so we looked into that and we, we took some concepts from self-determination theory and from broader psychology, the Schwartz values, if you happen to know that, and created tools, so created a tool online, uh, the values finder, and created a workshop unit um, to support people to better understand what do I stand for? And what you see on the right-hand side is some scheme, uh, even without going into the details, here along 20 well values, you uh, can analyze what are the values that are really important for me. And then if you work in a team, you can, you know, you can compare these things and say, okay, where's the common denominator or where do we anticipate frictions? Because typically it's okay to have those frictions. Diversity is a good thing, but you should be aware of it and you should not just stumble into a conflict about these uh, divergence in value perception, but you should work with it and make it two points of view that can come together in order to create something bigger. And now these are things where you can, of course, also ask, is the company that you want to do, is the value proposition that you develop, the product or service that you develop in line with your own personal values? And you can challenge that and potentially pivot and go into a direction that is closer to what you want to do. And that, of course, has to do then with um, one of the aspects of this Ikigai scheme, which I showed you. And then building on what also Thomas Hirt said, I mean, we live in a world and the generation that is at the university today or working on the PhD or being a master student, whatever, is a generation that will have to face significant challenges. These are not small challenges. These are really significant challenges that ask for new solutions, new ways of doing, technically, socially, business-wise, in many ways. And of course, we can try to bring in this kind of horizon into the training process, but also into the inspiration process. So typically, if you look for opportunities, if you do a structured search for opportunities, if you try to create a workshop for opportunity recognition, be it for students, by the way, or be it for companies that you consult, um, you can bring in these questions and say, okay, how do they have to do with who you are what you can do and how you can earn money. I mean, this, this is what the world needs. In a way. And of course, these 17 goals are quite high level. So you have to break it down. You have to be more specific, more precise and everything. But yes, you can enrich the brainstorming environment. You can create ideation anchors around those kind of topics and thus encourage sustainable entrepreneurship and enterprising for these big challenges. And with that said, let me conclude with this last, last slide from Alexander Titel, who was also in the air before for, the, um, for exploring the, um, the, the audience. Now, Alexander is working on his PhD thesis and among others, he's working on this topic of opportunity recognition and how we can create workshops, how we can create a method in order to support enterprising individuals or organizations to systematically come up with high quality ideas. And without going into the details here, you see 
basically this thing which is called in the academic literature the entrepreneur opportunity nexus, right? This special circumstance, this special juncture of a person and a situation that suddenly says, this is my thing, I want to pursue this. And um, you see on the very bottom, these different structural elements that you see the value circle, you see the SDGs. And of course, you also have the technologies at hand. I mean, especially if you work in a university, in a technical university, there are these new things that are explored in the different faculties and which may be part of a solution for these problems. So you can bring all these things together, create a cocktail, make clear that this has to do also with what you want to do in your professional life, and then from there on, start the journey. And with that said, I hope I could give you an insight about the, um, at least the tip of the iceberg of what um, entrepreneurship education at the KIT is about. And I would be very glad both to take answers, but also maybe to cooperate with you in one or the other format in the near future. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Ted Cedis, for your keynote. Dear participants, you now um, have the opportunity to send in your questions for Professor Ted Cedis. You can do so simply by going into the chat if you are watching us on Zoom uh, and just send a private message, private message to Q&A Ted Cedis. And, um, we, uh, we've received a couple of questions already. Now, a little bit earlier, Professor Tetzidis, you mentioned the cooperation with the EM Strasbourg. Do you see any more cooperations uh, with um, other Epicure Alliance members in the future? I think so. And, but I think we also must thoroughly think about how we can do that. Because obviously, I mean, we have, our day has 24 hours, right? And our week has maximum of seven days. And probably there are more opportunities that we could follow up. But um, maybe with all the experiences that we made over the past nine months, I would say, with the digital media, we can find ways that are scalable and which create a certain fluidity between locations. And then we also have to think about how to find ways to combine that with physical presence. But I think we should look into that. Yeah. Um, and uh, sort of joining in on that, you also mentioned the joint entrepreneurship school and the exchange with China. Is that something that in uh, times of Corona and COVID-19 can happen fully virtually? Or is this sort of, does it, is it something that has to be put on hold for the minute? That, that was, that's a very good question. We, we, we had that question in April because we had scheduled the Joint Entrepreneurship School for July for the Chinese to come over, I think, in September, we would have gone to Shanghai. Now, obviously the Chinese government closed the borders, our governments closed the borders. There were no flights, even if we wanted to go. Yeah. So I contacted my counterpart, Professor Xu Zhao at the STJU and told her, look, she, I mean, it's an experiment. I don't know if it will work, but I would like to make it in a virtual thing. We've got six hours of um, time shift. You know, we can start at eight o'clock in the morning. That's two o'clock for you. We have four hours of overlap. I will create videos. The Chinese will watch the videos in the morning. The Germans will watch them in the afternoon. And then in the four hours of overlap, we do this action learning thing. So we give short impulses, they work in teams. We used neural, we used um, Zoom breakout sessions and everything. And which was the fascinating point. I mean, there is always a cultural thing, you know, you go there and it's really fun. I mean, we went to Hangzhou the, the last time I was there to visit Hangzhou is a, you know, 10 million city in China, three hours south of uh, Shanghai, where the, the corporate headquarter of Alibaba is. So we went to visit the, the, the corporate headquarter for Alibaba. 
and uh, discuss with them and so on. So there's always a cultural program. So you see things, you smell things, you know, you eat Chinese food or they eat German uh, Boritian or whatsoever <laughs> and enjoy it. And you don't have that. But then we said, let's try to emulate that. And we asked the students um, to create videos of their normal life. We said, create a short video, you know, just walking over the campus or, I mean, some of them, they were locked down also in China. So they, they were not in Shanghai. They were somewhere in their hometown, in the province. Or somebody was in, in, in the uh, Elsass, in the Alsace, um, because he lives there. He's a KIT student, but, and his, his partner, she's um, um, growing horses. So he made a film of, you know, where he lives and the horses and everything. And we had a film of somebody in China, you know, who showed, you know, they made the, the most favorite uh, Chinese pop song these days together with the video. And suddenly we had these great video sessions. It was really amazing to see that. And I think, of course, it's better and more fascinating to go there. But frankly speaking, I mean, I know the place. And when they took us along these videos for a moment, at least, I was traveling there. It was like being there, you know, it was like really remembering. Probably if you've not been there, it's more difficult, but still it's the best we could do. And I think it was uh, great that we did not just say, oh, we cannot travel, that's it. But that we said, no, let's see how far we can get. And I would say it was 80%, which is better than zero, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. That's what I think is the interesting thing about these times, to sort of come up with new possibilities instead of just putting the head in the sand, as we would say in German, uh, and then just give up, you know, come up with new possibilities. And who knows, you know, maybe in a few years, there's going to be a new combination, you know, of video and or something. That's, I think, what will happen, yeah. Professor Tertidis, we have a couple of questions. So yep. Michael Kühler um, asked, um, First of all, thanks very much for the intriguing presentations. I was wondering whether you would think that there is a need for contemplating on possible ethical implications or challenges that one's business idea could include, or would you think that such questions are already included mainly in the SDGs? That's a, well, that's a great question. That's a great question. And indeed it um, puts the finger on where we are. I didn't go into more depth, but Thomas Hirt, um had mentioned this Academy for Responsible Research, Teaching and Innovation. And we are part of that. And in fact, we have two PhD students currently that work on exactly that kind of topic. So one of them, she's, she's Sarah Manthe, she's, she's um, thinking about something like an impact assessment. So we know that, you know, I mean, at the KIT, we have the Institute for um, estimating the consequences of technologies. Among others, we don't do this for the German parliament. I mean, the, the, ETAS, the head of the ETAS, Armin Grunwald, is the head of the German, of the, of the office of the German Bundestag yeah, for, Technologiefolgenabschätzung, that's the word in German. So, so estimating the consequences of, of technologies. And we, we cooperate with them, you know, in order to think about how can we use these impact assessment thinking early on in a startup process. So I think the SDGs are one aspect to it. So it's the responsibility to innovate and to enterprise where possibly, where, where possible. But then there is a second um, thrust, which is also related by to a big European discussion. Yeah, the, it's called the RRI, Responsible Research and Innovation thread that you have in the European Commission. Um, and it's about, okay, now we have something, take the example of a social network, I mean, in 2006, 5, 6, 4, 5, 6, when these things started, of course, it was a wonderful thing. I mean, we have these media, this new media, we can connect, we can exchange, it's a great thing. But nobody would have thought that it will become, you know, the, the you know, a proliferation of 
fake news of, you know, blaming people, um, you know, for all these kind of things, which are not nice. I mean, don't you, if, you, if you're aware of all these things, you know, where people are even in Wikipedia, you sometimes have that, you know, where people, I know a journalist, somebody of your job, you know, who talked to me that they created an article in Wikipedia, which is nuts, you know, but he's not able to get it out of there. Mm -hmm. because you don't have the governance criteria and everything. So of course, Wikipedia is a great thing. I'm not challenging that. But we would have to think about the collateral effects very early on. And I think very early on, you could have had, I don't know, you know, something like a watchdog organization, something like that. You, you can think about mechanisms to think about the, 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 the damaging consequences of these things. And we invent them 10, 15 years later. And that's that's a pity. I think by you know early on creating awareness about the dark side or potential dark side of what the innovation may bring can help you to manage that in a much better way. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's a great question and it's very interesting to think about that. And, and that's something that where we do research and we will for sure implement something in the near future, in let's say in the next 12 to 18 months to really uh, come closer to that. For the moment, we always had that philosophy to say, what is most important is that what people do is coherent with their values. And that already is an interesting discussion because sometimes, sometimes they do things and then we see their values and we say, guys, I mean, this is not coherent. What are you doing here? And then they start thinking. Do you stop them then or do you? No, we don't have the right to stop them. It's, I mean, they're all free people, but we can make them aware of it. And do they then stop or do they continue on? Like, are their own values? Typically, they, typically it plays a role. It does play a role because Early on, you have the choice typically. You can go either this way or that way. And, you know, if you do things where you can say, I'm, I really like it, it's really consistent with who I am. I mean, if you do a startup project, you go through a crisis sooner or later. There's no way around it, right? Um, so, it will be painful. And if you look into the mirror in the morning and say, I know why I'm doing this, you will continue to do it. Well, if you look into the mirror and say, I'm doing this, but actually it's not what I'm here for, you will stop. But so it's also from a very pragmatic point of view, it is something that, that does play a role. We have, a, we have a couple more questions, a short question, um, which uh, can be answered, I'm sure, rather quickly, is how are the trips to China funded for the students? We had a program from the DAAD, from the German, um, authority, the German institution that helps exchange. Okay. Uh, Michael Kühler uh, uh, sent a message saying thank you very much for your illuminating answer. Um, and then Johanna has a question. Uh, do you believe your students uh, would also be interested in social entrepreneurship? This is, I guess, connected to the previous question. Can we teach not only technological, but social innovation that can be also created with the use of new technologies? In other words, human-centered innovation. Absolutely, yes. And we do, um, again, I mean, maybe I can also give you that metaphor. What are we doing? We're doing... <clears throat> something that you would call scaffolding. I think in, in pedagogics, people say, use that word. Yeah? So in German, it's Gerüstebau. I don't know how you say that in French. And, and uh, I could say it in Greek for the guys from the Salonique. So, yeah? so it's about, if you build a building, first you build things that help you build the building. And what we do as entrepreneurship educators or as coaches or consultants is to build a scaffold so that the entrepreneurs can build the building. And obviously with building the right scaffold, you can also inspire them to think about that social dimension. 
So it can be a social dimension. It can, of course, also be a social focus where you say, we want to do this and that. And I mean, to, just to maybe give you a little detail in the lecture, when I introduce entrepreneurship, you know, an entrepreneur, and then of course it's it's very obvious that you have to show one or two examples. And I always show Jeff Bezos as a conventional entrepreneur, if you wish. I mean, as maybe the most successful of the of the last generation. But I also show Yunus, you know, with uh, Grameen Bank in in Bangladesh, who won the Nobel Prize. Maybe he's not. Um, the richest person on the planet, but I think he's done something very honorable and respectable. And I always try to be, you know, balanced in my examples that I say that entrepreneurship is ultimately about enterprising, about taking initiative, about seeing something, seeing a possibility and then taking initiative. The people that created the Red Cross in a way were also entrepreneurs or Greenpeace or whatever you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So of course that can be an interesting thrust and we try to train people in a way that they would be also prepared for something like that. Okay. What would um, your vision be for entrepreneurship education within Epicure? That's a very good question. Um, I would like to see some formats that really go across the Epicure framework. I mean, there are some, in my opinion, low hanging fruits, some quick wins, which we could realize. I give you an example. I mean, we could make a challenge across the network and then, you know, have a competition on that. Um, I think we've learned to do these things also virtually. So it's not necessarily, at least for the first round, it's not necessarily related to huge travel costs or efforts or something. So we can reduce the geographical distance with this, these media. And maybe then for the final pitch, you know, for the final winner to have 10 teams fly to one of the places, to Amsterdam or Vienna or wherever. Um, so I think that is a low hanging fruit if we wanted to organize something like that. But of course there could be also an exchange among the entrepreneurship educators, just you know, to exchange best practices and experiences and maybe material. You know? I'm very open to that. I mean, there is no secrets in what we do in that sense. It's very transparent and, and I'm willing to share all these things. So, that could be a thing that we could do. And then we can see how to take a further step, but there I would always try to say, let's be, you know, let's be intelligent about how much effort is it and how big are the benefits. So we should look for those things which are feasible to do with moderate benefit with moderate efforts. But have big benefits, and I think that's the surge we should we should go for. Absolutely. Okay, so here in the chat we received a couple of invitations. Uh, there's a social entrepreneurship uh, competition in Freiburg, and there's a webinar. Let me check if there's any more questions um, at the moment, dear viewers. This is a, an outreach, a call to you if you have any questions for Professor Tetsidis, uh, this is your moment. You can now still ask a couple of questions. But I see at the moment there, there, is, a, there is no other new questions here for the minute. That's also um, good. I can, I can get my tea then. <laughs> you can always get your tea. What's, uh, what's your hope, what's your wish for this very first um, Epicure Forum, Professor Tetsidis? I hope it creates a good basis for you to network, for you to create fluidity, you know, in the conversations and in the interactions. Yeah, I think that's what, what these forums can be about. And it takes, of course, as everything, you know, as everything in life, if you want to get something back, you need to invest in these digital media. My experience is 
the investment is to, you know, to be, to pay attention, if I say it in very simple words, you know, to not to be distracted from, from the other things, but to really follow what happens. And then typically you get something back, then you really connect to the other people and, and what is important to them. And, and I think that would be a great thing if we could use these media to um, bridge the distances and learn to use these media in that kind of way. Fantastic, Professor Tacitus, that's a great closing word. I thank you very much. I can only agree with uh, what um, I believe Michael, Michael Kühler said. Thank you for your illuminating keynote and thank you also for taking the time to answer all those questions. I, at this point, can ask for a big round of virtual applause to you. Thank you very much, Professor Tacitus. You're very welcome, Kusi, and, and it was a, a pleasure for me to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, we are um, a couple of minutes early, but that's fine. I will take the time to introduce our next speaker to you, who um, I hope is uh, already waiting in the virtual wings for you. Uh, your next speaker has um, extensive experience in urban planning, in traffic and transport, in climate protection, as well as energy and public participation. And she was the first green vice mayor of the beautiful city of Vienna for nine years until 2019. During her time as a first green vice mayor, she implemented various innovative projects that contributed substantially to Vienna's number one position in the international livability in the last decade. Today, she works as a strategist and also as a global advisor. She is a member of the Epicure Advisory Board and she is one of the 15 expert members of Horizon Europe Mission Board on Climate Neutral Smart Cities, advising the European Commission on the mission design and also implementation. In her keynote now, we will be looking at the following question. What makes a city a good city? What makes a city a city one that you actually want to live in because you want to and not just because you have to? How can new urban quarters be used as an opportunity for transformation and repair in regards to smartness and life quality? And how can the proposed mission of 100 climate neutral cities be fulfilled? If you, dear participants, have uh, questions um, that you would like to pose to our next keynote speaker, who I can just see in the chat is not quite here yet, uh, but I'm hoping that she will be here very shortly. If you have any questions um, and you're joining us on Zoom, then you can very easily just uh, write a question, a direct message to Q&A Vasilaku, uh, which you'll find in the chat section in just a few moments. Um, and then I can uh, relay the question to her. So uh, let me check the chat, I believe. Uh, She's uh, probably, no, she's, uh, she's not quite here yet. So we're waiting just a few minutes for Maria Vasilaku, who will be with us um, with us very shortly. Maybe you can also to uh, tide over the time so I don't have to come up with these long monologues. You could also write into the chat how you're doing. If you have any input for this very first Epicure Forum, we know already, of course, where you are joining us from. Um, and we know what organization you are from. But um, of course, if you want, you can just write now into the chat if you wish um, your input so far for this forum or also maybe what are your hopes and what are your wishes for this forum? What are you most looking forward to? You can uh, let us know to send us a quick message in the chat. And then, uh, of course, there's also the outlook for tomorrow. We have uh, a fantastic day tomorrow uh, with um, lots planned. We have a, a keynote of Professor Dr. Phoebe Konduri tomorrow evening. She'll talk to us about uh, financing environmental projects. Um, and then, of course, in the morning tomorrow, we're going to have some workshops prepared for you. They are in the morning exclusively for university teaching staff. We're going to be uh, looking at experts experimental learning as well as teaching. And then in the afternoon, we will be opening up the forum to all interested parties, um, but more on that a little bit later. So I just received the message 
sweating here a little bit. I received the message that uh, our next keynote speaker is online and she is ready. So I would like you to please give a big round of virtual applause. Please welcome Maria Vasilaku. Great to have you here. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, hello from Vienna. It's great to be with you. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I will share my screen and uh, start with my presentation. Um, so I will try to make it full screen. Yes. So once again, good afternoon. Um, tonight I will be speaking about managing and planning the major urban transitions needed to actually plan the city of tomorrow, which means that it will be, of course, also speaking about the city of tomorrow. What does it look like? What are the main strategies to get there? What is the state of play? And once again, how do we get there? Now, um, as we all know, we already live in the so-called metropolitan century. Our urbanization proceeds um, and urban growth is projected to rise to 85% by mid-century. Uh, we already have several mega metropolises, um, so uh, metropolitan areas that reach up to 40 million um, inhabitants. Um, and I guess what we all know right now is that there is only one choice that we have. Either we have managed growth or we have mismanaged growth and missed opportunities. Uh, phase two of uh, uh, the agglomeration means high externalities and high costs for metropolitan regions. Just to name some, um, we have growing disparities, we have a two-tier labor market, we have uh, opposition to urban growth in the meantime, we have high urban scroll, sprawl, congestion, pollution. Um, and let's say, to put it in simple words, that the role of national states is not all, always in favor uh, of future development uh, for cities. So in many cases, um, they may be adopting politics, policies, policies, excuse me, uh, that may even um, lead actually to, to a worsening of these trends. But then let's start with the basics. I mean, what is a city? Is this a city? Would you believe that this is a city? I personally would say this is not exactly a city. It is part of the functional entity of a metropolitan area, but it lacks several actually elements that I would believe that belong to a city of the future. Is this a city? Well, most probably, yes. I think most of you will agree with me. Um, and there is a quote by Jane Jacobs um, that has been extremely influential to my thinking. Um, she once said, the outside of the buildings is the inside of the city. And what she meant by this is the importance of public space. The Actually, the importance of these places where the city materializes, where we have a chance to encounter each other, uh, where we get inspiration, where uh, we slow down our pace. Um, so I think that this gives us a clue that placemaking is extremely important as a matter of fact, and that what we mean uh, when we speak of a city has a lot to do with as an urban field, and the urban field, once again, has a lot to do with the qualities of public space. And then because everybody is talking about, you know, smart cities and smart city strategies, I just wanted to tease you a little bit by asking what is smart? I mean, is this smart? I'm not so sure if this is enough to be smart. It's one of the smartest places on earth in terms of technology. It is uh, the traffic organization entity for Beijing. 
um, I love technology. I, I love real-time data, especially when, when it comes to trying once again to steer traffic. Uh, and yet we all know what mega cities look like, actually, as a matter of fact, also what Beijing looks like. And not only in Russia, it takes about two hours uh, um, in, in um, congestion to get anywhere. I personally say smart is more than that. Smart is also inclusive. Smart is green, which means that for me, smart means using technology in order to achieve inclusive cities that provide high life quality for everybody that can be afforded by everybody by consuming as little resources as possible at the same time. Now, with keeping this in mind, let's move on to the next question that I believe to be crucial for the future of cities and for, the, for planning the city of the future. What is actually life quality? Well, I personally believe life quality, that means a good city, is a city that's good for children. And you may ask why, and I say, because a city that's good for children is good for us all. It's good for every generation. And then again, you may ask why? And my answer is because as soon as, well, let's say because what we all long for for our children is what we long for for ourselves. What is it that we want for our children? We want them to grow up in a healthy environment, to be able to move around freely, to play, um, to grow up in a safe environment, we want them to have contact to nature, we want them to be able to play with water perhaps. And all these things are actually things that we long for for ourselves as well. This is what makes us happy also. So this is why young couples, when they know that the first child is well on its way, normally say, oh, now we have to move out of the city and buy a little cottage somewhere near the city, so in the suburbs, so our child can have a healthy, happy childhood. But we all know that as soon as they do this, um, they end up, as a matter of fact, in congestion where they spend the rest of their lives. Uh, and this is also one of the main reasons for suburbanization, besides, of course, non-affordability uh, of, of um housing within our cities. So this leads me actually to proclaiming that planning a good city, a robust city, a resilient city, a city for the future, has to do this primarily with these three things. Affordability, livability, as I have explained it right now, and community. Now, from vision to strategy. How do we actually plan a city? I mean, this is how they used to plan it a few decades ago, but today it's all about strategies. Strategies are replacing plans. Um, and we will be talking a lot about strategies tonight. One strategy may be using new urban quarters as an opportunity for transformation and repair. Cities and metropolises are growing rapidly, which means that we have to keep creating new urban quarters. And in most cities worldwide, we have, just to give you an example, former brownfield areas that are up for transformation. Uh, so we have big chunks of land that can be redeveloped in new urban quarters in pieces of city. Uh, and the way, once again, we plan them and create them is decisive, actually, not only for life quality within these quarters, it is always, I do once again, to improve life quality and to repair the surroundings within the city. So just to give you an example how this may work, using new urban quarters as an opportunity for transformation uh, means, for example, um, as we do in Vienna, redeveloping former railway areas that are not needed anymore into new urban quarters with vast accessible green spaces in the middle, very dense at the edges, but once again, 
vast, open, accessible, usable green spaces in the middle, and to connect these three spaces with each other and with already existing green spaces, thus creating a network of green spaces, I would say an archipel of green spaces that covers the entire uh, surface of the city. And of course, it's about transforming historical neighborhoods, improving the qualities of public space, uh, and turning gray streets into places for life where people love to be, where people love to walk, and where people love to encounter each other. This is just an example of what this may look like. This is from Warsaw. Um, it's a part in Warsaw that has been transformed into a campus that I personally believe that shows exactly what I'm talking about, combining historical elements with new elements and wonderful qualities of public space. And another example, uh, King's Cross, uh, the King's Cross development with a huge zero depth fountain that, as you see, is a community magnet. I would go so far as to say it actually creates a community because this is a place where people spend time and you may get to know each other and form new ties. And then, of course, it's about mobility, the city's backbone. So it's about public transport, cycling, walking, and the new trend, sharing. Last example, when it comes to strategies for creating the city of the future, uh, another example from Vienna, the 30, already 30 citizen solar power plants that were created um, with actually involvement, financial involvement of the citizens um, of Vienna. Now from vision to mission. And you can see I have written putting a man on the moon again. Um, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the horizon missions of the European Union um, and actually the future uh, of at least big parts of the Horizon program. Um, now, the Commission uh, decided to create five mission areas. One of them is climate neutral smart cities. I will be focusing on this in the next couple of minutes. Um, they formed boards. I am, a mid I am a member of the board on climate neutral and smart cities. And we were asked to be bold and inspirational, to give a clear direction, to be ambitious, but realistic. Um, to spark innovation across disciplines, to adopt very, very central, a bottom-up approach, uh, and to engage citizens. Now, why cities? Well, cities occupy already 2% um, of the planet's land mass, but consume 65% of the world's energy. They're growing rapidly, um, as I have already said. And on the backdrop of the Paris Agreement and uh, the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, we all know that it is cities that hold the key to the future in their hands. Uh, the mission that we have proposed is 100 climate neutral cities by 2030, by and for the citizens. And the elements of the proposed mission are, among others, a new model of city governance. Um, so we need a holistic approach, um, integrated planning, integrated governance, and a new culture of collaboration between all stakeholders to get there, a new role for the citizens. So it's not about just citizen involvement, it's about citizen action. And we propose that at least 1% of the funding should be granted directly to citizens to support their actions. Um, it's about creating a climate city contract that should be uh, signed by the participating city, the region, the national state, the commission, uh, and is binding. And it's about a new integrated form of funding and financing. So it's about a one-stop shop uh, that would, um, as a matter of fact, create a lending and blending facility uh, so that we can actually achieve that the climate city contract is already uh, clear to go uh, at the moment that it is signed, including financing. Um, this just lets you see how intricate the, the um, 
cooperation and interaction between the different levels uh, is. So speaking of a new model of governance. Um, and of course, um, the variety of the financial instruments that are to be applied, uh, most um, notably, once again, citizen participation as well. Um, these are the different phases. Uh, this is just to give you an impression of the different phases of uh, the selection process arriving at the Climate City contract. What I find most interesting here is that uh, multiple stakeholders are to be involved in each and every phase of the creation of the plans of each city as to how to achieve climate neutrality, including the quadruple helix. That means academia, um, businesses, um, citizens, and of course, administrations. Um, and here it comes to um, taking just a brief glimpse at what needs to be done in order to achieve climate neutrality uh, within uh, the city. Uh, we're speaking here, of course, mainly about scope one and two emissions. So we can see the biggest chunk is buildings followed by transportation. And um, here it comes to the financial needs. Um, but I would say the most interesting slide is this one. Less than 10%, or let's put it another way, a maximum of 10% uh, should be public investments. The rest should be private investments by companies um, and the citizens. And what we see here is that public-private partnerships and public-private investment vehicles are actually the way we can, the only way I would say we we can actually achieve financing climate neutrality uh, within the next decade. Um, I will skip this. It's just to show um, how what the different phases of the mission are. Uh, and the Green Deal calls have already started. Um, the first tranche is to be followed uh, by several cascading calls. Um, it is indeed uh, several billion uh, that um, the, the, the European Union is to invest, um, actually, as a matter of fact, almost the entire budget that is to be invested um, in order uh, to achieve the vision of climate neutrality. Okay, and then you may say, this all sounds wonderful, how do we make it? So let's talk about managing the transition and how to put the man on the moon again. Well, the OECD and the World Bank, say we should address growth management. So transport, land, housing, fiscal systems, and the World Bank says it's about planning institutions, investment, and initiatives. And this is what endless lists look like of what can be done and should be done at different parts of the world when it comes to policy. I say, though, it's more important to think about the challenges we're facing right now at the next level and what this takes. So what are the required systemic transitions? Well, it's about retrofitting from corporate to individual. What do I mean by this? It's about um, actually coming into people's homes and finding new financial and legal instruments to motivate, um, to bring a momentum into retrofitting of private households. It's about energy, so from local solutions and pilot projects to systemic approaches involving uh, renewables. It's about transforming mobility from infrastructures to mobility services. It's about a new economic focus from growth to circularity, and it's about factional entities from city to region. It's about a cultural shift from consultation to collaboration and citizen action, and from antagonism within the region to sharing. Um, a new governance. Um, so forget about a state, the role of the state and the city as providing everything. Um, the new role is to be a facilitator, which is actually where social entrepreneurship uh, starts or where 
most probably you start understanding the new role of social entrepreneurship. Uh, but we will be talking a little more about this in a second. From institutions and from institutions to networks. So it's not so much about creating new institutions. It's more about managing, steering, and creating, once again, networks. It's about a new notion of leadership from decision maker to stakeholder manager um, and to the management of the entire ecosystem uh, for innovation. And it's about financing from pilot to scale. And this is what we need. We need a new paradigm, thinking out of the box, stepping out of silo politics, integrated urban and regional planning, a new culture of cooperation and collaboration, scaling up, partnering for bankability, innovative financial and legal instruments, systemic innovation from closed to open systems, technical innovation, social innovation, sustainable entrepreneurship, um, governance innovation, and a new role for the cities and regions um, at the heart of steering once again all these processes. And what is the state of play? Now, we already have innovation platforms that are being formed in Sweden, just to give you an example, where viable cities are already preparing for climate neutrality for 2030 and are actually to launch um, a big event in two days from now uh, to give, so, so as to start officially. Um, and then a consortium of Spanish cities Altogether, more than 20 cities preparing together. Four of them will be applying for the mission uh, and the others will be cooperating and benefiting from uh, the overall innovation consortium. Um, we can see that we have governance innovation. Just to give you an example, Manchester that created new metropolitan governance tools, but also very, very presses very hard for PPPs as a standard for development and implementation of strategies. Um, they have been doing excellent work um, in, in managing the entire Greater Manchester region. And I would say what we can also see um, as excellent examples is strategy development, already strategy development as a PPP. That means developing the strategy for the city and the region, including businesses, social entrepreneurs, and the people. Um, and excellent examples for these are, from, for example, Amsterdam Economic, the Amsterdam Economic Board, uh, or uh, Barcelona, uh, the way they have created uh, the Metropolitan Plan. But I, I, I just have to tell you that this is actually right now a big trend all over the world. Um, social entrepreneurship comes into focus pioneering for urban transformation. Just a few examples. There are historical examples from Vienna because in the end, Vienna's social housing system uh, resulting in more than 200,000 subsidized units uh, right now um, is actually in, 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 the, in the process of decades, a wonderful example of originally social entrepreneurship. Um, pop-up markets, um, an agency uh, that, that is um, actually managing uh, empty shop spaces uh, or what you can here see, um, oh, the first cycling cycle sharing scheme worldwide uh, was a wonderful example of social entrepreneurship 20 years ago here in Vienna. And what you can see in the image uh, is a collaborative housing project uh, that uh, is actually uh, subsidized and um, designed by the tenants themselves. I think one wonderful example also is the City Makers Initiative in Pakwis de Swiga in, in Amsterdam, involving all Amsterdam citizens uh, that uh, want to that have an idea of how to transform the city, but also bringing new social entrepreneurs uh, with um, um, people that have already um, actually implemented an idea together um, and matching, mixing and matching and creating new coalitions and partnerships this way. Uh, Demos Helsinki, a think tank in Helsinki is an excellent example or the second home uh, in East London. If you ever are in East, in East London, just visit. It's a wonderful, wonderful 
um, example of, of, of a new space uh, for social entrepreneurs and not only. And social innovation, what we have right now is emerging public plural partnerships. Once again, the PACWIS is a wonderful example, the community grant scheme in Vienna, where uh, citizens can create parklets themselves is a wonderful example, or the citizen solar power plants that I have already mentioned. So we arrive now at the takeaways. What are actually the takeaways? Well, first of all, a huge trend towards collaboration. So emerging public plural partnerships, social entrepreneurship, once again, coming into strong focus, stakeholder management um, involving and steering the quadruple helix, joint spatial economic growth initiatives within the region and partnering, scaling up for, for bankability. The second takeaway, huge trend towards PPPs. I would say it's revisiting PPPs or perhaps the rehabilitation of PPPs to put it this way. It's actually a totally new approach where you already have businesses that care for the future, that care for climate neutrality, that actually approach the city, the city that they may even take up a leading role. And by this, I do not mean only large corporations. It can be small businesses. It can be uh, local businesses. It can be social entrepreneurs. But the trend is once again to, to involve them straight from the beginning, already in strategy creation, and of course, later in implementation, financing, etc. And it's about new, a new notion of, of, of leadership that we need. So it's visionary, it's long-term, it's vertical and horizontal. Uh, so it's not only on behalf of the city, it's through the entire cycle. It's collaborative and it is outgrowing borders and, 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 and silos. So a city taking up a leading role for the entire region and connecting, sharing, steering processes with other cities, with small municipalities, um, yes, and so on and so forth, perhaps also across borders. Um, and last but not least, when it comes to the takeaways, we see that the fundamentals are leadership and vision, you need a plan, you need um, branding, open governance. When it comes to operations, it's about using opportunities, so it's about tactics, creating scale, legal and land use tools, financing PPPs, coordinated action. And when it comes to the momentum, um, I think the momentum is excellent right now. Uh, we have calls right now, we have grants opportunities, we have the missions, we have the Paris Agreement. Um, of course, you need to, 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 to use trends um, and, and new technical innovations. And I think that also uh, participation and citizen involvement creates also a wonderful momentum. Um, where we reach now, what, and now finally we reach the perspectives. Uh, what do I see uh, coming, let's say? Well, I would say, um, it starts with balancing municipal interests in metro regions, so leaving antagonism behind and achieving integrated planning, joint land policy, uh, a spatial economic, well, spatial economic growth policies, and what I find most important, sharing costs and benefits. So that means you do not have this type of 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 planning you know, economic growth strategies that would mean that you would have shopping centers exactly at the border between one municipality and the other. And you would have situations where one municipality is bathing in money, as we say in German, and the other ones are bathing in, in car traffic. Um, it's about once again, sharing revenue, sharing benefits and achieving joint land policies and economic growth policies. It's about the trend towards circularity. So not only spatial green economic development strategies, but also circular economic strategies. Uh, what you can here see is actually uh, a pic that I have taken from uh, the strategy of Ghent, which I find 
wonderful, not only because they are already moving towards circularity, but because they have also an excellent uh, stakeholder management forum where they actually involved straight from the beginning, the Ghent port. Um, and they're, they're doing just brilliant work uh, along the way. Uh, and this is a trend. This is something that is com coming and popping up in cities throughout uh, Europe. And then, of course, to regions of neighborhoods and local green deals. So if we want to achieve climate neutrality in the city of the future, it's not only thinking of, of, the, of the entire region as a functional entity, it's also about refocusing on the very, very local level of the neighborhood, which is actually where we can involve the people and where we have the scale to involve small social entrepreneurs. Um, and this is just an example that shows the perspectives for the future, uh, running in um, who are actually uh, out and about to create local, 130 local green deals for each and every neighborhood towards climate neutrality. They have already started uh, with three. Um, and a wonderful example is the Padapur local heating network that is actually being developed uh, by the citizens themselves. Um, so last but not least, on a very general level, it's about a new culture of collaboration um, involving sharing, being efficient, once again, um, responsible, creating connections and so on and so forth. And the magic word in the end is together. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Maria Vasilako, for your fantastic keynote. I see we have a lot of questions that uh, come in uh, or have come in while you were speaking. But before we begin, I would like to ask you a question because we went into the keynote saying, what is a city I'd like to live in? I'd like to know from you, what is a city you like to live in? What does it need to offer? Well, uh, I, I think that I have answered that. I, I really love to live in a city that has excellent public transport a city that's made for walking. Um, even if I don't decide to, 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 to go for a walk, I want, I want it to provide excellent qualities to be attractive, to be inviting for walking. I want it to be green. I hate traffic lights, as a matter of fact. So I want to be able to move around freely. I want pedestrian zones. I want shared spaces. And uh, I love water. So you may have noticed in my, in my images, I think that having access to water and to nature uh, is not only fun for kids, I love playing with water and zero depth fountains as well. Fantastic. Okay, so let's have a look at what questions uh, came in. Um, okay, so we have, which incentives could be given to private companies to support the creation of carbon neutral buildings? Well, um, I think that when it comes to, to I think we have to, 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 to discern between residential buildings and office buildings. Now, if you look into, into what happens with office buildings right now, I think you have almost no office building anymore um, that uh, can, can create a business case without um, having some kind of, um, lead platinum or whatever they're called, you know, uh, certificate. So this is ongoing right now. I think what is more tricky is, 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 is residential buildings. Uh, when it comes to creating new buildings, I think we have uh, building codes and standards. Um, and it's about more or less legal instruments, to be honest. Um, when it comes to retrofitting old buildings, it's a relatively easy task uh, when they belong to large corporations or cities, non-for-profit organizations, etc. Just, just to give you a figure in Vienna, already 40% of all residential units have been retrofitted, but that's easy because they, be they belong either to the city of Vienna, mostly as public uh, housing units, or they're subsidized housing units and belong to large non-for-profit corporations. So the most tricky part is how do you get into the households? And um, what 
what I have found out in, in, in discussing with colleagues across Europe is it's less about financial incentives. You, you may be able to introduce one or the other grant. Um, the problem is that um, in many, many cases, um, first of all, it's very tough uh, for, for, the, for the residents to, 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 to have a mortgage, to receive a mortgage, right, right and loan. Uh, uh, so to get the loan approval. And the second issue is that when they move out, um, they, should not, um, they should not actually have to carry the loan around with them. So we need more, it's more a, a question of new legal instruments, if you ask me, and less an issue of, of financial incentives. Okay. Which constraints and opportunities could arise from PPPs in the creation of the city of tomorrow? And why is the potential of co-creation important in this context? Well, I would say the, the, the opportunities are numerous. I, 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 I wouldn't know where to start listing. Um, I mean, remember the slide that it is expected that a maximum of 10% uh, should be public grants. So we need corporations, we need PPPs um, towards the future. Um, and I think that the basic incentive for companies is, as a matter of fact, um, innovation and competitiveness. Um, so it's about moving as a continent towards climate neutrality and creating once again an innovation ecosystem that um, benefits European enterprises and, and, and companies in terms once again of their competitiveness worldwide, um, giving an opportunity to belong to the pioneers, to the first ones that have started moving um, in this direction. Now, when it comes, of course, to social entrepreneurs, it's a different story uh, because in many cases um, we're talking about startups or very, very small companies. And here is actually where uh, it is an issue of grants um, and it is an issue of stable uh, long term corporations, especially with cities and regions. So let me give you an answer. I think that this maximum 10 percent. Um, if I were to be asked, should not be spent predominantly for large corporations and companies that can access actually bank financing, but should be spent on the largest part for small companies and social entrepreneurship. I noticed on your social entrepreneurship slide um, that uh, Vienna had nine examples of social entrepreneurship examples. Um, did you help? Uh, further those projects on in your time as a vice mayor of the city? Yes, I did. Um, but I have to be honest on that. I think the city has a very long tradition on this uh, without knowing that it is actually social entrepreneurship. Uh, um, so and I have found that actually in many, many cases around the world, you have cities that will foster social entrepreneurship. But if you tell them, do you know that this is social entrepreneurship? They have no idea. It's just, it's just different traditions uh, that arise. And of course, I'm from Vienna, so this is why I have so many examples from there. But just to give you an example of, 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 of what this means in the end, I mean, Vienna has right now actually the capacity to to, to, to meet 100% of the demand in kindergarten uh, places for children under three. Wow. Okay, which is, no, excuse me, I have to correct myself, from, from children of three years of age, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And a wonderful capacity under three as well, but it's 100% of the demand for three-year-olds. So it's, it's a wow, right? And it's, besides this, it's free of charge. Huh. Now, how did we arrive at this 100%? Well, approximately half of it is actually organized by the city itself. And the other half of it is organized by children's, by, by parents' groups, by young kindergarten teachers, by small groups, um, 
NPOs that came together and started it. So in a sense, each and every one almost is a wonderful case of social entrepreneurship that has not only helped once again meet 100% of the demands they receive grants by the city, but have also actually helped diversify the system. So you have such a diversity of different types of kindergartens with, with bilingual ones, multilingual ones, experimental ones, Montessori ones, music ones, and whatnot. And you see actually, as a matter of fact, immediately that it is not only about innovating, it's about diversifying, okay? And it's about actually meeting the different needs of a very diverse population. So it's also about quality. And this is what fascinates me about you know, social entrepreneurship. Let's move on to the context of Epicure. Um, how could the universities get involved in planning the city of tomorrow? Well, I think for one thing that they are already heavily involved um, because um, I, don't know, I wouldn't know one city and one colleague in a city uh, that uh, who has not had, had a close cooperation between the urban development and strategy departments with research institutions um, and universities. But let me point out three, um, let's say three pillars. I see that it's about technical innovations, uh, for one thing, where you need, um, well, different types of living labs and where cooperation actually means coming together and testing. As a matter of fact, this is where once again, we need businesses um, and PPPs to create optimum and optimum ecosystem uh, for testing and, and, and pilots. Um, a second uh, pillar has to do with data. Um, um, so optimizing data, harmonizing data, and working together with universities and research institutions um, to, 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 to achieve once again here um, optimum results. And I would say, of course, uh, the new and third uh, issue, emerging issue is um, is, has to do with new technologies. Um, um, and um, it's about, let's say on, on, on behalf of the city, it has to do with, with open data and on behalf of universities and research institutions, um, it's a bit a role of, of, of uh, functioning as hubs um, to produce example given new applications um, and new services uh, that the city itself cannot develop and that are, let's say, too far out and, and, and beyond what um, research within large corporations may um, want to work at. Yes. I see, I see, okay. We received another question. How can we assure the representation of children's interests in the planning of the city of tomorrow? Could you repeat the, yeah. the question, please? How can we assure the representation of children's interests in the planning of the city of tomorrow? Well, um, I think um, in a way by, by, by involving them, by involving communities. I think that there is no other way to plan new urban quarters or the transformation of old urban quarters. Think about creating new parks, uh, creating pedestrian zones, transforming streets, and so on and so forth, without once again involving communities, um, affected communities, interested communities, straight from the beginning. Um, and when involving communities, this means also involving children. Um, now it gets too technical, uh, but um, for the sake of being brief, there are ways to actually use new technologies uh, to involve online um, different generations um, and to see to it that you have representative groups of people 
um, participating and not end up, um, sorry, I don't want to be mean to offend some anybody, but you know, this angry old man um, um, issue that we may be having, you know, also in participatory, um, you know, maybe situations. Sure. Having that maybe for sure. <laughs> So I say always see to it that you have more young mothers um, and less, um, you know, people that uh, have totally other interests. Um, and um, this may be a way to go about it. But I think that it is also very important to engage in direct youth involvement projects. Uh, you can involve schools, you can involve school children. And yes, it is possible to explain um, what is urban strategy, what is urban development, and what is the city of tomorrow also to children at an age of nine. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. They definitely need to be involved more. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, are a few comments here in the chat, uh, which I would like to let you know also. Um, so here is a, here's a, a comment and a question. I'm interested in how a future city involves the food system as well. How can cities secure the supply for that many people? Where do you see the main leverages to achieve a sustainable food system? Okay, I will have to pass on this question. I am not an expert on this. Um, and I, I dislike uh, pretending that I can have, I can give an answer to everything and anything. Um, so I would say um, just one thing, um, when, when it comes to, to food policy, um, I think that for one thing, if it is possible, um, then it is extremely important to um, foster and protect uh, agriculture uh, within the region um, and within the city. Just to give you an example, um, Vienna has um, the, uh, the capacity to, to produce 100% um, of our demand for different sorts of vegetables within the season, within our borders. And this is, of course, the result of the very, very active um, land policy. Remember, I was talking before um, about joint land policy for regions um, and integrated, um, actually, regional planning. And this is also part of what I meant. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, once again, I will leave it at that because I am actually uh, somebody who, who comes uh, from, 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 from the disciplines that have to do with, with urban development and land uses, uh, but uh, I'm not so much into agriculture. Okay. Um, another um, comment, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, and Joanna would have two questions for you, which I'll read out for you. So how do you see the role of universities in this process of cities transition? And do you believe that we also need to adapt and how? And we are facing different conflicts and interests on different levels, even on the SDGs levels. How uh, to overcome them in this transition process? Um, if it shall depend on the cooperation of different stakeholders, how did you manage those conflicts in Vienna or there are no such? Yes. Well, when it comes to, to the role of academia, uh, I think that uh, academia, well, it's uh, at a different pace as so from corner to corner within Europe, uh, but is actually already uh, on its way to very... Um, active and open corporations uh, within um, multi-stakeholder innovation platforms. Um, and I think that this is actually what it is about. So it's less about um, finding a company that will um, give a grant or sponsor some kind of specific research, of course, this as well, but it's more once again about creating open multi-stakeholder platforms. And this is actually the role of the city to do so, to invite, to steer, um, and to bring together experts, academia, businesses, once again, and of course, um, its own staff 
um, in order to cooperate, form coalitions, identify joint projects and move towards this or the other direction. Um, wonderful example for this. Um, take a look at two initiatives. You can, you can Google them, uh, Amsterdam Smart City and um, Amsterdam Economic Board. Um, and you can there see what I am talking about. Um, so in a sense, once again, I, I, I have never experienced um, a reluctancy on behalf of universities to be part of these platforms, of such open platforms. It is more to the cities, up to the cities to create them, to invite them, to involve them and to bring them together. Um, now, when it comes to uh, the, oh, and perhaps I should also say that, for instance, I, I was also speaking in my presentation before about the uh, Spanish um, innovation platform with more than 20 cities participating. It has been actually created on the initiative uh, of a university. So it can also go the other way around, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but I have to be honest, I, I personally believe that it is the role of the city to take the lead there uh, and to involve. Now, when it comes to the conflicts about the SDGs, now this is something um, you should invite me for another keynote, uh, please. I mean, it's, it's, it's an issue without, of course there are not one or two, but several and many. Uh, and I think that we need to talk about this, uh, but we need to talk about this systematically um, and, and, and we need an open dialogue. And I would love, for instance, to see, um, uh, let's say the, 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 the next urban forum, uh, for instance, um, um, well, taking this as an issue. Okay, the next urban forum, what do you mean? Um, we have the the UN um, okay urban forum, um, and it's I think it's uh, every two years, right? Um, and it has always uh, a different topic, a different focus. Uh, I think focusing on on the conflicts and uh, creating actually um, a multinational, multi level, and high level dialogue on this uh, would be something that I would love to attend. Okay, and we, of course, uh, would love to hear about it. And Joanna, who asked these uh, two questions, uh, says, uh, thank you very much. She would love to hear more. Maybe it's also an incentive uh, to hear more also next year and next year's uh, second Epicure Forum. So maybe we've got uh, the first keynote and uh, squared away already. So uh, Ms. Vasilaku, let me have a look if there's um, any more questions at the moment. I, uh, I don't see any questions right now um, for you. Let me just scroll through. I don't uh, see anything else. I think, um, yeah, you've uh, answered all the questions of our viewers out there on Zoom. I thank you kindly for your participation and for your very enlightening keynote. And um, yeah, we all hope to see you uh, soon somewhere on some platform. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Have a nice evening and a very successful forum. Goodbye. Great. Thank you very much. And with that, dear participants, uh, the official program, so to speak, of uh, the first day of the three-day Epicure program is slowly coming to an end. If you would like to inform yourself about what's going to happen tomorrow and what's going to happen on Friday, I invite you to either check out the Indico page, uh, where you have a detailed listing of the schedule, uh, or you could also go to the epicure.education page for in-depth information. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, Earlier. In the morning, tomorrow morning, we have workshops that are meant to be exclusively for university teaching staff. We'll be talking about um, experimental learning and teaching, and then in the afternoon will open up to all parties interested. And we're going to offer Epicure talks, uh, booths, the virtual fair, and much, much more. If you would like to get interactive on social media, I'll show you the hashtag again, be Epicurious. Uh, you can use that if you like. 
And um, I'll see you all tomorrow evening, if you wish, for the keynote of Professor Dr. Phoebe Konduri, which will also be live streamed on YouTube. And she will talk to us, as I mentioned earlier, about financing environmental projects. Now, if you are participating on Zoom, we still have something prepared for you. We have not one, but two rounds of um, a networking session coming up, the networking carousel, where you can meet fellow Epicureans and um, get in contact with them. Everybody else, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I enjoyed it very much. I hope you did too. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow evening. Have a great night and goodbye from me.